We are just now halfway through this series, if anyone was keeping score. So you uh, may uh, be interested in knowing that. Welcome, good to see you. Uh, we have uh, been focusing, we're focusing right now on that five-year period of time, 1740 to 1744. Uh, that's when everything changed. I called 1740 a year of change, you may recall. And uh, really it's during this time that we would say this great phenomenon in American history called the Great Awakening really gets going. <clears throat> and uh, this is, uh, of course, too early to call it that. People didn't quite appreciate yet what exactly was happening. They knew something was happening. They knew it was significant. It was sweeping. It was affecting a lot of people but it was only later that the term Great Awakening was applied to it, and so that's what we call it to this day. And probably these five years or so were the most important of that. From that point on it, the momentum certainly continued uh, for decades into the future, and in many ways, there's kind of an unbroken connection between these events that took place and what eventually became the uh, Revolutionary Wars we're hoping to detail as we go along. Last time we were looking, uh, first of all, at George Whitfield. George Whitfield, kind of the lightning bolt that hit the colonies in 1740, only here for a year, but everybody was talking about him, the talk of the town. By the time he headed back to England, people knew something had happened. But it was so fragmented. There were so many different reactions. Somehow he was bigger than life, but everywhere he went in his wake, you had all kinds of confusion, some difficulty, many people claiming a deep conversion, others not so sure, and it was rather a confusing time until the following year when Jonathan Edwards stepped into the picture and really brought kind of a critical ballast to this, really making it clear that this was not simply a flash in the pan. Something more was going on when he brought his deep philosophical and theological assessment to these events, people knew they had to take it somewhat more seriously. And that's really what began to happen. So we have these two men, George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, kind of a complement to each other, very different people, and yet somehow together they did represent that which was necessary. It reminds me a little bit of, as I think I said last week, Martin Luther, bigger than life, bombastic, shot from the hip, sometimes was a little bit, uh, you know, out of the, uh, just more than you would expect, but then he was followed by John Calvin, Mr. Sensible, Mr. Reserved, a genius for sure, but really much more of a quiet personality to consolidate what had happened. And those two taken together really give us a compliment, you might say in terms of those two of the Protestant Reformation, well, something like that, is going on in the colonies. These two personalities, Whitfield and, and Jonathan Edwards, uh, more or less working together, not consciously, but certainly representing that kind of contribution. All right, <clears throat> new paragraph in this introduction. Some of you know that I taught uh, for about 10 to 12 years in a classical Christian school here in Spokane, and one of the, my, one of the courses I taught over the years, year after year, was civics, and uh, the, the whole idea of political theory. So we went clear back to Plato's Republic and worked our way through, but sort of the culminating moment in that course was reading the Constitution. And I, was, I would always walk in as if I were almost holding the Bible, not quite, but almost holding the Bible. You know, uh, here's the Constitution, we distribute it. And every year for about 12 straight years, with every class that came through, we read every single word of the American Constitution and commented on it, sometimes spending a fair amount of time on just one word of the Constitution. I wanted these kids to be able to say for the rest of their lives that they have read the Constitution, which a whole lot of American people cannot say, you know. I won't show for a whole show of hands, so but you know, it is helpful, it really does give us some sense, not only of the structure of American government, but really something of the controversies that were in the air at the time. One of the lines that I would tend to focus on as we read the Constitution says this, that in our particular body politic, we will have no titles of nobility. It's a prohibition. 
We are not going to have titles of nobility. We're not going to have earls and dukes and barons and lords and all of that. We repudiate that because it stands for a way of life that differentiates us between nobility and common, aristocracy and everybody else. And we said, nope, not here. This is not the way we're going to do our understanding of life and culture here. And so we rejected it. And uh, now that wasn't quite so clear in 1740. In 1740, we still had a whole lot of English thought cycling through our uh, DNA, and even though we were maybe officially not adopting those, there was certainly a kind of an assumption that that was the way things would eventually go. And really, you would say that it was at this moment, these years beginning in 1740, that it became quite clear that is not the way this culture is going to operate. But I want to also suggest to you that even though we rejected aristocracy, as a kind of human institution, something that still remains in England, you know, in many parts of the world, but we rejected it. Nevertheless, there was a kind, I wanna say this very cautiously, there was a kind of aristocracy that did in fact emerge in these years. But the aristocracy that emerged was not driven by how you were born, but it was driven by how you were reborn. And in the Great Awakening, there was a huge emphasis on a new birth. And people who came to experience this that was called a new birth became very distinctly aware that they were part of something that God was doing and that there was a kind of special identity that they enjoyed that did distinguish them from others who hadn't had that new birth. But it was a distinction that did not make them superior but made them in some deep sense more servants of the rest of this population. But they had an idea, as Peter writes, that they were a chosen people. They had some sense that they had been chosen from the foundations of the earth, that they were a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Hard to imagine more sweeping descriptions of honor than a royal kingly priesthood that they were a chosen nation that had been called out to proclaim the very praises of God and that that was the privilege they had. And it really created this rather sweeping sense of a duty to perform in a culture that desperately needed that message. And that continued. And that indeed continued and gained momentum and in some ways you would say the springboard in our culture that launched that quasi-nobility, I'm saying it very cautiously, was these, these years right now of this great awakening. And I wanna highlight that a little bit as we go along today. <clears throat> and I'd like to do it by reminding you uh, what a common theme this is in the New Testament. Uh, you know, I think if you're looking for it, virtually every page of the New Testament makes it clear that while we may differentiate ourselves among ourselves humanly, that before God, we're all on equal ground. We all come into this world, both created in God's image, the Imago Dei, but also desperately in need of mercy. And whether I'm born noble or common, whether I'm royalty or just a peasant working in a field, at this point, we are all on equal ground. We all desperately need mercy, and without mercy, we're lost. And the only, the only thing it takes to get mercy is the recognition that I need it. All it takes is rejecting any claim I have to merit and simply saying it's by your mercy. Be merciful to me, a sinner. The sinner's prayer. But many people have too much ego to pray that prayer. They want to say, well, no, wait a minute. I'm not that bad. Come on. You know, they say, this is beautiful. I'm, that's, that's kind of undignified, isn't it? Prostrate myself at the feet of the cross, pray for the blood of Jesus. What a messy business that is. I think I can do better than that. And people who repudiate the offer of the gospel do so because of their pride, but also do so to their eternal peril. And that was really the calling card. That's really all it takes, you see. And so people came in by the thousands, 
prepared to pray the sinner's prayer, but many held back and said, no, 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 that's a little beneath my dignity, thank you very much. You know. Well, these are the things that are going on right about this moment. Well, you know, the New Testament gives us that message again and again, and reminds us again and again that there are no restrictions based on our human situation. Skin color, ethnicity, intelligence, you name it, it's irrelevant when it comes to these matters. When I was a kid, I was growing up, I sang a little song. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight, right? That was kind of the, that was kind of the message of these. And so people came in from every conceivable quarter of the human race. Nobody was held back. They, oh, I'm sorry, you can't come in because you're the wrong this or that, none of that. The New Testament breathes that. Every nation, tribe, language, and people we hear in Revelation. Seven times that phrase is repeated. But maybe what's called the Emancipation Declaration of the New Testament, the most famous statement to that effect is found in Galatians chapter 3. So I want to remind you of this. This will be the text we'll have in mind as we go along. This is Paul writing to the Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and following the Word of God. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's a staggering thought itself. Sons of God, royalty of the highest conceivable, imaginable weight. Sons of God through merit? No, through faith, you see, that humble acceptance. For as many of you as were baptized, which is a humbling rite, into Christ, have put on Christ. And here there is not Jew nor Greek. It's the destruction of barriers of ethnicity. People are not restricted because they happen to be of the wrong ethnic origin. There is no slave or free. How important was that in the founding era when many people were here in a slave status? But when it comes to these terms of engagement, Slave status or lack thereof is irrelevant to the question of whether mercy is offered to you. There's neither male nor female. One of the most really interesting aspect of the Great Awakening was the prominent role played by women. Women teaching, women preaching. And uh, this was quite shocking, of course, to the sensibilities of the day. And even to this day, it's quite shocking in some quarters. But the Great Awakening was really distinguished along those lines, and this statement by Paul, in some ways, you couldn't find a time in history where it was more pertinent than the founding era, when these were the very characteristics that were so much under discussion. There's neither male nor female, you're all, all of you, all of you, one in Christ. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, you are true Israel, the true descendants of Abraham, because it's not a matter of how you were born, it's how you're reborn, and you are Abraham's seed, therefore, and heirs of the promises to Abraham and his seed. We, as the people of God, are the proper recipients of the promises that God made to Abraham and to his descendants. We are those descendants. Well, this just changes your self-image, you see. It changes us dramatically. And at this particular time, people, especially from the lower echelons of the colonial community, came in in droves, responding to a message that they'd never really heard much before. There was an established church. It had its Puritan traditions and all of that, but it had become pretty stuffy, pretty restrictive, pretty demanding. And now Jonathan Edwards... George Whitfield are giving us a very different vision. And so in some ways, that's what I think we begin to see even as early as the period we're thinking about right now. All right, well, let's, uh, with that lengthy introduction, let's uh, have a word of prayer and we'll get underway. Father, we're grateful that you are a God of grace, that you invite us into your presence, not based on works of righteousness in which we can boast, but based, in fact, on the great promise that if we humble ourselves in your presence, you will exalt us. But if we exalt ourselves in your presence, then we put distance between you and us. We pray that we would be those to learn that lesson. And we ask that our review of this moment in history would help us do so. 
In the name of Jesus, amen. So last time it was the Great Awakening spreads. Now I'm saying it gains a new vision, and it's really this vision. The new birth creates an emphasis on equality and an emphasis on a kind of uh, liber, uh, liberty that comes by virtue of this freedom in Christ. So the gospel message with this notion of equal dignity in that we are the, in the image of God, but equal need because we need grace. So this new birth was a message that generated a sense that I am somebody special in God's sight, not because I deserve it, not because I'm, I have merit on my own, but simply because grace has been showered upon me, and with that grace comes the duty to proclaim it. <clears throat> this really is a measurable phenomenon at the time, and it's been noted by scholars who are not necessarily people sharing this attitude, but just simply surveying what was happening in the colonies. I've mentioned to you J.D. Dickey before, he says on this point, unrestrained by boundaries, the new siders preached everywhere with massive defections among parishioners from the old school. The new side movement was filled with women, Indians, slaves, indentured servants, laborers, paupers. These are the people who just came crowding in, these thousands of people gathering to hear Whitfield preach, touched by the sermonizing of the time, for the most part were what we would call the lower classes of the colonial society, and there were plenty of them. And these are the ones who in a sense resonated with, now not exclusively, there were people from every branch of human society, but these especially tended to respond to this message. Well, part of the conflict was that this invitation to come to Christ extended to everybody, and the main resistance was that we were accustomed to thinking of some people as superior to others and not quite so desperately in need of grace. You see, we have an idea that there are some people who really need grace, and then there are some people who are just pretty good, and they don't need as much grace. And the idea here was that that view of a kind of stratified society was really coming to us courtesy of old England. And so as the Great Awakening was getting traction, part of its message was a critique, and a quite obvious critique, of the abuses that could be traced back to England. And this is still the beginning, then, you see, of this kind of rising resentment, you might say, of the negative influence England had played in the colonial experience up to this moment. Again, Dickey says, there was a raft of lay itinerant preachers who went out preaching here and there. The tenor of the message increasingly placed blame for the unhealthy state of faith in the colonies at the feet of the Church of England. He says, Sorry, I'm trying to get myself... You have no idea how complicated this is. There we are, all right. Such social and racial mixing was anathema to the traditionalists who mocked the evangelists for provoking it. Yet even their lampoons could not account for the rampant social leveling, that's the term, that had broken out with such powerful effect. The masses in all their ragged and untamed emotion, in all their heady spirits and unlearned ways, had become the firmest allies of the new lights. These people coming in, many cases not very well educated generally, but they hear the message of the gospel and they uh, respond to it in these ways. Well, these themes were dominant. People who've looked at this closely have noticed that it really was the main topic of discussion across the colonies. Ben Franklin himself spent fully a third of his print covering this conflict. It was a major part of what he was concerned about and what he reported on. He was noting the differences, and of course I mentioned last week Franklin worked his best to stay out of the fray. He wanted to be a reporter, you know? He wanted to be Joe Friday, just the facts ma'am. He didn't want to take sides, didn't want to get uh, too involved in this, but he reported on it quite uh, consistently. And uh, he distinguished rather dramatically between the old birth folks, proud of their birth, proud of their heritage, proud of their lineage, and the new birth people who had nothing to boast of in terms of their human status 
but they were very much aware of the work God had done in their hearts. <clears throat> and Franklin wrote a bunch of little ditties. You know, he was good at those. And uh, some of them actually treated this subject. So here's one, just a representative example. This is Ben Franklin, original poetry by our founding father. And he says, quote, among the divines, that is the religious scholars, of course, among the divines, there has been much debate concerning the world and its ancient estate. Some say twas once good, but now has grown bad. Some say tis reformed from the faults it once had. I say tis the best world, this one that we live in, either to lend or to spend or to give in, but to borrow, to beg, or to get a man's own, it is, worse, it is the worst world that ever was known. Franklin here, you can see what he's doing. The, you see the conflict, the old and the new, and then he weighs in, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. You see, he's just saying, well, fine, it's a world of opportunity, let's have at it. And uh, so he kind of takes a, a third position here, but recognizes how much of the culture is being shaped by these uh, uh, forces. <clears throat> All right, well, Yale University. Uh, Susan Strong is not here. And she asked me a great question last week and caught me really flat-footed. And the question was, what were the origins of Yale? And I have to say off the top of my head, I couldn't give a good answer. As it turns out, uh, I, I discovered as I was prepping this week that this becomes a major part of our story. And so it was kind of good she asked me that. It kind of set me up for it, you know. But uh, I did find one little quote that does help us at least get a snapshot of this. Yale was founded in 1638. That's six years after 1632, right? Massachusetts Bay, 1632. Six years later, it was founded by 500 Puritans. So it goes back to English Puritans, as does Harvard. But Princeton, come uh, College of New Jersey, come Log College, was the Presbyterian school. So we have three schools at this point. Uh, but anyway, uh, Yale was founded by the uh, Puritans. The dream of Reverend John Davenport, not James Davenport, no connection, as far as I know, no relation, uh, to establish a college to train Christian leaders. So Yale is feeling now the tension. I've mentioned this before. John Edwards, Edwards preached there, of course, trying to heal the wound. Still, there was a little bit of the dissension going on, the conflict between the old and the new. The new side students were becoming aware that Yale had drifted from its Puritan roots, that there had been an, a sort of a lively sense of this Calvinistic gospel back at the beginning that had pretty much been lost now and that Yale had sort of drifted from those roots, and these new side students were calling the faculty and the administration to account. And one young fellow who did so with a particular amount of sort of biting criticism was a young fellow by the name of David Brainerd, whose name you may recognize. David Brainerd uh, was pretty good at, uh, at kind of sharp one-liners, and on one occasion he said of one of his professors in one of his classes, in the presence of that professor, that that chair over there had more Holy Spirit in it than you do. Now, you know, um, that's kind of a risky thing to say uh, to your professor, and, uh, but he did, you know, he was kind of filled with a little bit of the enthusiasm of the moment, and he was sufficiently uh, poignant in that comment that he got expelled. He got kicked out of Yale for making such an insulting comment to his presser. Maybe he deserved it, I'll leave that to your judgment, but one way or another, he's out on his ear. He was such a popular student, he was so well-liked and so respected for his faith, and indeed for his articulate ways, that the school went kind of up into a, a sort of an uproar that required it to be shut down for two months. There was so much furor surrounding this expulsion of David Brainerd. David Brainerd, however, simply bid goodbye to Yale uh, and went out to become a missionary. And for the next several years of his life, he was a missionary to Native American tribes 
scattered throughout the colonies and a little east thereof. He went from place to place in all kinds of weather, uh, sometimes horrific conditions, uh, preaching the gospel here and there, sometimes to virtually no response, sometimes to amazing responses. And he journaled all this rather in detail. And so for some four or five years, he carries on. Now he was impeded not only by hard weather, difficult terrain, and all the normal challenges that most of us would feel, but he also had a pretty bad case of tuberculosis. And so he documents as he's riding along on horseback, sometimes he'd have to stop actually spitting up blood. He was quite ill, but he was so called to the task that he felt God had given to him that he went ahead and did this. Uh, So for about five years, he carried on this until at age 29, at the point of death, he wound up in the home of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards knew of him, took him in, Uh, gave him a a bedroom, assigned it to him, and uh, cared for him, hoping that he would recover. And so David Brainerd wound up under the care of uh, Jonathan Edwards. In fact, a very interesting kind of side uh, detail here is one of the daughters of Jonathan Edwards. He had about 12 kids, and one of his daughters uh, sort of took it upon herself to be his personal nurse. Here's this bedridden fellow, you know. Uh, But she fell in love with him. She was doing her very best to try to nurse him back to health in the hopes that they could eventually marry. It didn't work out that way. And so David Brainerd died in the home of uh, Jonathan Edwards at the age of 29. Jonathan Edwards asked David Brainerd if he could have permission to publish the journals that had been written by uh, David Brainerd. He kept very detailed journals, and so uh, that permission was granted. And uh, some time later, of course, after the death of uh, Brainerd, uh, this book came out. Now, we're a few years down the road. I'm skipping ahead just to include this little detail. But, uh, but this was titled The Life and Diary of David Brainerd, edited by Jonathan Edwards. This one became an overnight sensation. This is another of his writings, which just really swept through the colonies and through England. And it was so popular in England that it became kind of a a national bestseller for a time. Uh, But one person who read this book written by, uh, uh, sort of edited by uh, Jonathan Edwards was a fellow by the name of William Carey. Uh, William Carey, who is usually credited as the founder of the modern missionary effort, uh, was living at that time in England. He was a cobbler, worked on shoes. He'd always had a heart for mission, but when he read this book, it just was transforming. He was a Reformed Baptist in England, part of the nonconformist uh, population there. He presented to the elders of his church the proposition that they should help fund him going to India as a missionary. And they basically said, in your dreams. <clears throat> in fact, the famous line from this is, you know, God can convert those people anytime he wants, and he doesn't need help from you. A little bit of cold water, you know, on his enthusiasm. That caused uh, William Carey to write a book in t- that was went by the title roughly, Why God Will Use Means to Convert the Heathen. Means meaning missionaries, people, human beings, going out there and accomplishing that. I've always been fascinated, if you've been around for a while, I've mentioned William Carey, of course, more than once. Um, but I had an opportunity just this past week to talk to a fellow who is from India, grew up in India as a Hindu became a Christian under the ministry of a fellow named Zig Ziglar. Some of you know that name, uh, which when he was about 30 years old, traveled with Zig Ziglar for about 20 years, is now himself, he's about 60 years old now, a uh, motivational speaker and evangelist and so on. But anyway, I had a conversation with him, never met him before, we just had it. And I was curious to ask him, he grew up in India, he was a Hindu uh, before his conversion, he was there for 30 years, And I asked him, you know, I've heard that William Carey is still highly regarded in India. And I wonder if you can, uh, you know, confirm that. And he said, oh, yes. Yes, when I was growing up, we all knew who William Carey was. And he was quite enthusiastic. He said he was known as a man who established schools of higher education, who did all kinds of beneficial things with respect to the multiple dialects, 
that were spoken in India, kind of reducing them to writing and, uh, and generating a, a huge amount of progress at that time in our history, and he still celebrated, uh, you know, even though uh, he, it was known that he was a Christian, and not every Indian is a Christian, obviously, but he was just recognized as a, as a, a very uh, interesting and important influence in Indian history. And so you can, you can trace this all back to David Brainerd, who died at 29 years old, you see, but who uh, carried this message to the native tribes. Uh, and uh, so we have this wonderful kind of, uh, you know, ongoing story in effect. All right. I want to uh, tie up a few loose ends from other conversations we've had. One involves a fellow named James Davenport. I've called him politely, Christianly, the lunatic French. He was a whack job. I mean, I'm just saying this with uh, all due respects, you know. But, uh, but he did have an amazing ability to communicate and kind of move people by his rhetorical styles, even though they were, they were pretty edgy, pretty out there. And during this crisis at Yale, following the expulsion of David Brainerd, James Davenport thought this was a great place to do some ministry, so he showed up with his followers. By this time, the followers are called Shepherd's Tent. That was the name. It's about 200 people that were following him around. And he started preaching in the most uh, sort of over-the-top uh, ways about Yale and about what had been taking place there until finally he was publicly arrested with a high degree of drama. He was tried and there were all kinds of riots outside the courtroom. I don't know if you can imagine a trial with riots outside the courtroom. Can you imagine such a thing? But anyway, it happened then. Makes you think maybe things haven't changed as much as we thought. But anyway, riots during the trial, but in the final analysis, James Davenport was de declared to be a nut job. He was declared to be insane, deranged. What do you do with a guy like this? You send him to Long Island. And that's what they did. And so, with his followers, still loyal, James Davenport went to Long Island and now began to plan his next attack and this would be on New England. And so there he goes, leading his, his uh, following with him into Boston, and once again, all kinds of street preaching, causing all sorts of public disorder. And once again, there's a kind of arrest uh, and a treatment of him that reached the conclusion that the guy is crazy. And that was the uh, uh, assessment that was made. But the, the reason I'm mentioning this is because it does call forth a character, and I don't think I've mentioned him before, uh, his name is Charles Chauncey. He was a congregational pastor, old school, committed to the old school, and he believed that James Davenport really symbolized everything about the Great Awakening that he didn't like. And so he attacked James Davenport and his followers, blaming him for the riots, for the disruptions, and blaming Davenport himself for his outrageous behavior, but then throwing into the mix, blaming George Whitfield and Gilbert Tennant and all of these other peoples and blaming them for the disruptions. And uh, he became what appeared to be at the time the most intractable enemy of the Great Awakening that had yet come forth. He was an articulate, brilliant man. He wrote uh, vigorously against the Great Awakening and mentioned all these people with the notable exception of Jonathan Edwards. He had such respect for Edwards that in spite of Edwards' support of the Great Awakening, he didn't want to quite go there. But otherwise, he was quite the uh, uh, <coughs> decided uh, opponent now, the reason I mention all of this is because you can see the title of the book here, written by Charles Lippe, is Seasonable Revolutionary. This man, Charles Chauncey, a congregational pastor, old school, nevertheless, by the time we get to the period within five years of the American Revolution, has become maybe one of the two or three most powerful clergy voices supporting revolution in all the colonies. And so the transformation of this man is really quite a spectacle to behold. And so I wanna just highlight at this point, no one would have guessed it, you know? Who'd have thought 
that this man, such a hostile voice, would eventually become one of the most powerful supporters of the revolutionary effort. So I just leave it with that for now, but we'll return to him. About this time, Jonathan Edwards wrote another book. Uh, once again, he's trying to bring some peace to a rather uh, tumultuous time. The, entitlement, or the title of this book was simply, the short title is Some Thoughts. Uh, the long title, the Puritan title, uh, Some Thoughts Concerning the Present Revival of Religion in New England and the way in which it ought to be acknowledged and promoted. I don't recommend this one as much as I have others. It's a good book, it's a good read, but there's others I think that are better to read first, unless you want to become a, an Edwardsian scholar, as they're called, but this is good reading, but it uh, is kind of a follow-up to other things that he said along the way. Well, this brings us now to what I'm calling a year of choices. This is really now where this kind of new population, what I'm calling a sort of quasi colonial aristocracy, but it's kingdoms aristocrats, you know, it's Christ's aristocrats, not colonial aristocrats, you understand my distinction there, uh, begin to really have some impact in the culture. The year is 1743. Again, uh, uh, I've mentioned to you before, Alan Heimert. Alan Heimert wrote a book in, 19, er, in 1966 in which he explores <clears throat> the religious culture in the colonies and explains the connections between that religious cu culture and the Revolutionary War. Alan Heimert, as far as I know, is no Christian. He's just purely a historian. Uh, and he was approaching this, I think, somewhat surprised at what he discovered, that how much of the rhetoric of the time, how much of the thought, how much of the justification uh, was really related not to politics but to theology. It became political eventually, but not immediately. And he details this in, in a book entitled roughly uh, uh, Religion in the American Revolution, something like that. It's very much uh, uh, a turning point, you might say, in modern scholarship. Many others followed suit later. But in this book, he just uh, makes this, this is just a short quote. Calvinism offered, quote, a radical, even democratic, social and political ideology and evangelical religion embodied and inspired a thrust toward American nationalism, really honestly acknowledging the role that this Calvinistic spirit, originally with the Puritans and the Presbyterians, sort of, uh, you know, revamped, retooled, uh, reignited, restarted with George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, uh, really kind of returning to its roots and recognizing how much that played a role in the uh, ensuing uh, years. John Calvin, uh, you don't have to look too deeply in Calvin's writings to see uh, where the justification for a revolution might be found. I'm just gonna give you one quote. Uh, this is from Calvin's commentary on Daniel. Uh, and in this, he says, quote, for earthly princes, earthly princes deprive themselves of all authority when they rise up against God, yea, they are unworthy to be counted amongst the company of men. We ought rather to spit in their faces than to obey them when they deal so proudly and stubbornly that they will despoil God of his right and as it were, occupy his throne as if they could pluck him down from heaven. It's pretty strong language. Now that's Calvin writing 200 years earlier. He's talking about Nebuchadnezzar but nevertheless, the principle here and elsewhere became pretty important in the founding era. Again, Dickey says this, a lengthy quote, but worth uh, thinking about. The world at this time now in colonial history had turned upside down and gave everyone a sense of vertigo. Yet regaining the balance and harmony of the former world would not be possible. Too much had changed. Too many had been transformed. No one could return to the complacent peace of early America, where Puritan divines and Anglican authorities held unquestioned power. British North America had become broken. It's always shattered and replaced by strange forms that few could have imagined or expected. A new, feral, violent America was growing up from the ruins of English gentility and propriety and a psychological earthquake had reshaped the human landscape. I think that's what happened. 
it's, it's, you know, two million people or so at that time in the colonies, and something was changing the whole landscape, and it really did have almost incalculable uh, effects uh, going forward. So you have enemies of the Great Awakening. Laws were passed in many places, outlawing itinerant preaching, outlawing the very means, the medium by which this Great Awakening was uh, was uh, getting traction. Royal authorities sponsored by England were clamping down on what they perceived to be threats to their power. Ministers who were part of the old school were condemning these, a great, what they called depraved ideas. But nevertheless, the fact that it was being attacked in this way uh, was met, you might say, with the, with the enthusiasm and the fire that was being inspired in these people. And the critical point now, as we're wrapping up, the fact that the Great Awakening was being attacked using the implements of law, you see, outlawing various activities, outlawing preaching in the public square, outlawing free speech, you might say, certainly outlawing freedom of religion, all of this being sponsored by English authority, British authority, clamping down, trying to prevent the growth of this popular grassroots movement, forced the Great Awakening at this juncture to become, become much, much more political. Because now it was a matter of meeting a political threat with a political response. And so in some ways you'd say it's even in this period, this five-year period, that we already begin to see that what is certainly at the heart of the matter, a kind of spiritual renewal, is nevertheless taking on a somewhat political edge to it in the response to these attacks that were brought to bear against it. The term that came to be used at that time and for many years thereafter was preaching politics. I brought to you a volume some time back, it was one of two volumes, entitled Political Sermons of the Founding Era. Political sermons became a common expression of the religious life in the colonies at that time, and it only became more and more sort of energized as the years went on from this point. Again, uh, Dickey says, the Anglican Church emerged as the foremost nemesis, the Anglican Church now, as the foremost opponent of the revival. Its clerics used whatever platforms they had to attack it. Most of these enemies were paid by the church, that is the Church of England, as missionaries for what was called the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, SPG. It represented the Anglican attack, okay, on the Great Awakening. Uh, they, could, they could denounce the Calvinist uprising with little fear of popular backlash to their positions or salaries because they weren't paid, you see, by the community. They were paid by England. And so they had a kind of, uh, of uh, independence. The Anglicans saw all dissenters as heirs to the Puritans who had murdered King Charles I a century before. Thus, not only were the Anglicans adversaries touched with madness, they were outright traitors and a continuing th threat to British rule. <clears throat> okay, final couple of details here as we're wrapping up. What happened to James Davenport? It ain't a pretty picture. But I'm telling you, this is the last time, I think, in this whole series, I'm going to mention his name. So here it is. What happened to him? He was responding to the attacks by Charles Chauncey. In a public bonfire, he threw his books into the bonfire to the cheers of the people who were there, hearing him with his outrageous incendiary preaching, and he was so moved and so excited by that moment, he actually ripped off his own trousers and threw them into the fire. And all the people that were there watching this went, oh, what? And that was a dramatic turning point. It's like even these people who had been the most staunch Loyalist supporters said, you know, I'm not sure the guy's all there. And uh, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> even though he later recanted, I'm sorry, I got out of control, it didn't matter. 
he basically lost all credibility. The difficulty is that even though James Davenport from this point faded into the landscape of history, he died a few years later, kind of a broken, sad character, you know, James Davenport continued to be the target of the enemies of the awakening. They used his name continually to paint with a broad brush everything that otherwise was happening. You know how that works. You take the most outrageous example of something and use it to discount everything that may otherwise be good. Exactly what happened here. Another little detail I want to wrap up. I've mentioned to you Samuel Adams. Uh, Samuel Adams graduated from Harvard University in 1743. Oppressive British policies had crushed his father. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. It's more than uh, you need to hear or want to hear, but I'll just tell you the real brief version. There was a whole lot of, of uh, economic struggle that farmers were having because of British policies, and Samuel Adams Sr., the father of Samuel Jr., of course, had developed what was called a land bank. It was perfectly legal. You know, the details I won't bother you with, but it, the fact is it provided some considerable relief to beleaguered farmers and gave them some opportunity to make some headway. England saw that those were the seeds of a kind of independence that they didn't like, and so ex post facto, they criminalized what Samuel Adams Sr. had done. In other words, something that was legal at the time was made illegal later, and then he was prosecuted for a, for a crime that wasn't a crime at the time he did it. If you don't mind me mentioning it, when I went to law school, the lowest grade I got in any class was a C plus. I'm just gonna tell you that, it's a C plus. I graduated pretty good standing in the class, but the lowest grade I got was a C plus. And the reason I got a C plus in constitutional law one of my favorite classes was because the professor threw a subtle ex post facto little fact pattern into the story, and I missed it. And if you miss the ex post facto, you got a C plus, period. I'm still upset about that. You know? <clears throat> These are subtle, but uh, ex post facto, that's why I have a, an affectionate connection to that phrase, because uh, it uh, was one of the sorriest moments of my uh, law school career. But anyway, uh, uh, this, uh, this crushed Samuel Adams Sr. He basically was wiped out financially because of this. Uh, the uh, act of the British against Samuel Adams Sr. was condemned universally in the press. It was seen as the most unjustified and indeed virtually criminal act that it could maintain against him. Uh, some phrases used to describe the British at this point, carnal wretches, this is 1743 now, hypocrites, fighters against God, children of the devil, cursed Pharisees, this is what the paper had to say about the British, but not much more could be done about it. Interestingly, at this point, there came to be a kind of tie between the enemies of the awakening and the enemies of the land bank, you know? And uh, so this is just the way people were thinking. Parliament crushed the land bank, destroyed Samuel Adams Sr., all intended to make an example of any who would test the will of British authorities. Samuel Adams Jr. took the matter to heart. His Harvard thesis was no mere academic exercise, and the amicus patre, that was his pen name, was intended to fight military oppression. Samuel Adams, Jr. graduated from Harvard, 1743. His senior thesis was developing the proposition of the right of rebellion against tyrannical governance. And it was quite a piece of work. Um, <clears throat> Adams graduated from Harvard, 1743, part of Jonathan Mayhew's class, we've talked about him. In his senior thesis, he answered the question, whether it be lawful to resist the supreme magistrate if the commonwealth cannot be otherwise protected. 
Samuel Adams argued that natural rights allowed citizens to defend themselves, an argument he derived from Locke, and behind Locke from the Puritans, Locke's father was a Puritan pastor, and behind uh, the Puritans, Calvin himself. It was quite a piece of theological work that was provided by Samuel Adams when he's just a young man, and you can tell that over the years, he, he never lost that fire. You see, that became very much a part of his story. So uh, he'd grown up in the awakening. He'd seen Whitfield at his peak. He'd seen the effect of the new birth on his classmates at Harvard. And it was the marriage of his faith and his patriotism that drove his writings. All right, just briefly, uh, Gilbert Tennant, we'll wrap up a little bit on him. He became the pastor of Second Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. It was a new side Presbyterian church. It was the Second Presbyterian Church. He became a little bit less vitriolic. I've described him earlier as a hellfire preacher, a little less hell and a little less fire. He remained orthodox, but now as a pastor, he kind of modified his tone slightly. And so he becomes a pastor and serves that uh, very successfully for some years into the future. The other fellow, last one I want to mention, is Alexander Craighead. He also has some interesting things that take place here. Alexander Craighead, you recall, was booted out of the old school Presbyterians. He started the new Presbyterian church, but he's still unhappy. He is kind of a renegade. Uh, Scott Seifert says of him, Craighead announced his decision to move to the back country. Now the back country means South Carolina, Mecklenburg County. I've mentioned that earlier, so that rings the bell, I hope. Uh, he made a decision to uh, uh, move to the back country November 11th, 1743 called for any with the stomach to join him in his self-imposed exile, and they drew their swords in a symbolic renewal of the Solemn League and Covenant, Richard Cameron, to symbolize their commitment, as Cameron and others of their spiritual forebears had done. One called it a declaration of independence and of war in the cause of true independence. And the following year, 1744, George Whitfield comes back and we'll save uh, <clears throat> some discussion of what happened there uh, for next week and following. All right, just a couple of thoughts here as we wrap up. Number one, there is a nobility of this world which celebrates birth, wealth, power politics, worldly prestige, elite status. I don't need to tell you that. Jesus said to his disciples on one occasion, the rulers of this world lord it over each other. They love it, power. They love the ability to make other people obey them. That is the mother's milk of power politics in this world. And it's been that way throughout human history. It's no different today than it's ever been. There is a nobility of this world. However, there's another nobility. There's a nobility of Christ's kingdom which celebrates not birth, but new birth. Not uh, wealth, material wealth, earthly wealth, but eternal wealth. Not power politics, but the power of the spirit and of the word. Not elite status by birth, but a life worthy of our calling. This, of course, was what was being recognized by people at the time. Hopefully it's being recognized by all of us because we all live at times when it seems that things are going on that shouldn't be and we wonder what we should do and scratch our heads and ask ourselves the question, what's God calling me to do? And I think we need to always bear deeply in mind that we are God's elite forces, special ops in this world. He's called us to a calling, but it's not a calling of power politics. It's a calling of his word it's a calling of his truth. It's a calling of nobility and dignity in his kingdom rather than in the uh, structures of this world. So the greatest display of power of the nobility of this world is no match for the mildest display of the power of him who reigns eternally and commands all men everywhere to repent. I'm done. You're so patient, you know? And you actually are good at looking interested. It's just wonderful. I just, we're good. Thank you so much. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer.
Our Father, we are grateful for this remarkable story. We thank you that you called forth from virtually fishermen working on the docks in Capernaum. You called forth equally unlikely people to be the emissaries of the truth and the gospel of Christ. We thank you that there's not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty that you call to serve you in this world, that it's been your pleasure to use those who are less likely, but to use them to accomplish great things. We thank you that we have a great uh, laboratory example right here of that kind of thing happening in our own history. We pray that you would continue to bless our review of these matters and that all of this would be to the praise and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, asking these things in his name. 